Okay, thank you all for coming um, and thank you especially for Hannah for being on a Sunday. So we're really pleased to have Hannah Haney talk to us today from the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and Hannah is a linguist who specialises on languages of North America but really explores questions of linguistic diversity and language histories um, that are relevant globally. Um, and she does that through studies of different language families and different regions, but on a global scale, including um, Indigenous Australia. Um, so, um, different from many historical linguists, Hannah focuses on language change and diversification, not just as a temporal phenomenon, but also as something that requires spatial analysis. And so we see this in her work um, that I really like on the linguistic and social processes that underpin the way loan words spread um, through across languages. Um, and she's done work on that, particularly in Australia and North America and South America. Um, but as well, her research um, refines how questions of linguistic geography are investigated. And she does that through integrating methods from linguistics, but also geography, ecology, and evolutionary biology. And so today, it's really lovely to have Hannah um, talking to us and in our Synapse seminar series, um, and talking to us about language diversity through a biogeographic lens. So thanks so much, Hannah. Thank you, Beth. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. It's nice to see some faces that I um, know and I'm distant to and faces I don't know and um, I'm excited to talk with you all today. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, sort of approaching language diversity through a biogeography lens. Um, and I'm going to um, talk primarily about two studies, one older and, and one newer in my um, research history. Um, and then talk about directions for future research, research to try to bridge the gap between micro scale and macro scale variation and how we understand them. So just to add a little bit to Beth's wonderful introduction, um, I have backgrounds in both linguistics and geography. So my training um, in my PhD and postdoctoral experience has primarily focused on linguistics um, and particularly language diversity and language change. But I also have a, a strong background in geography through my, my bachelor's degree in geomorphology and more recently a postdoc I did in human biogeography and biocultural diversity. So I sort of approached my career um, as a linguist um, in a way that's kept me in touch with sort of my geography interests. This has all led me to think about um, how language, languages diversify as a spatial process. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about language diversity at multiple spatial scales, how we can understand that um, through a case study of the sort of geographic component of diversification within the Eastern Miwok branch of the Miwok language family in California. And then through a larger scale study of the geographic patterns of language diversity in North America. And then I'm going to discuss um, briefly some future directions that I'm pushing in to try to bridge the divide between understanding how small scale variation works in languages um, and how we arrive at the large scale patterns of geographic diversity that we find, you know, in the world's languages. So just to start off with a little um, discussion of spatial scale and uh, language diversity to set the stage. There are two questions that I'm going to talk about today. The first is, why do language splits occur in the places where we find language boundaries? When we think about languages and language families, um, I know that there's, uh, you know, kind of characterizing what is a language and where those boundaries are can be a tricky, um, a tricky proposition. But um, we do know that ultimately we can think about language as something that um, that diversifies through splitting into different different um, languages. Where do those boundaries arise spatially and why? Um, the second question I want to talk about are why are some places in the world more linguistically diverse than others? Um, what drives the sort of large scale patterns in language diversity that we can see at a larger scale? And the important question that this is all driven by that I am really interested in, but haven't quite arrived at all the answers to yet, um, is how we can understand the processes that might link these sort of micro scale and macro scale characterizations of diversity. There are a lot of questions that we haven't answered or even thought to ask yet. So I'm gonna start by um, narrowing down the problem and thinking purely about geography for today. Um, so just within the realm of space and geography, um, there are a number of questions we can ask. What sorts of geographies impact dialect diversity? It's a very 
small temporal and spatial scales, what sort of factors might create discontinuities in the relationship that we might find between isolation, isolation by distance to use a, um, a biological term, and then on the other hand, linguistic diversity. In other words, are there identifiable factors that might influence the formation of language boundaries and the emergence of those boundaries from continuous variation? How do the sorts of processes that, um, that occur as language, language families diversifies impact broader spatial patterns of linguistic diversity? And what other mechanisms might be at play that determine the patterns of language diversity that we can see in the world that have developed over immense time depths and larger scales? So there's a lot to think about here. Um, for starters, um, from a small scale, we can kind of look up. When we think about um, language variation at the dialect scale, um, we can ask what sort of things predict it. Um, people have proposed that isolation is important for understanding patterns of dialect, um, dialect geography. Um, so how should we characterize isolation? Is this purely a matter of spatial distance? How well does, uh, does this sort of physical isolation predict dialect diversity at all? That's something that um, seems to vary from place to place and language family to language family. Um, and how well does that isolation then predict language boundary formation? This is what I'm gonna be asking when I talk about the historical dialectology of the Eastern Miwok family, the first little study I'm going to talk about, which is a little bit older work of mine. It's not, um, it's been on the back burner for it's kind of reached its conclusion and I'm not, not working on it as actively right now. The second study I'm gonna talk about is a more recent one, um, looking at North American language diversity at a larger scale, so the entire continent. When we look at the languages that occur on the North American continent, what sort of factors impact these diversity patterns that we can see in those languages? And how universal or generalizable are these influences of the environment or local ecology on language diversity? And then, you know, the, the questions I want to, I, I really want to think about are how can we bridge between these scales? We have very small scale geographic variation and very large scale geographic variation. What links these patterns and processes? And how does global language diversity arise from language family growth and diversification? There are a lot of open questions here, and I'm going to mention some ongoing and proposed future work, um, but I'm, that's, you know, an area where I'd be re really curious to, to chat with you guys and hear what you have to say about these, these questions. So, um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is looking at language diversity within a family. Um, as Bloomfield pointed out in his, um, you know, his classic work, Language, we don't think of language diversification as something that happens to large uniform speaker communities that catastrophically break apart. That is the exception, not the rule. In fact, um, we expect that, uh, that there's not these sort of sudden cleavages between, between speaker groups that create language diversification. Um, we have to understand this um, as something that develops out of more continuous variation across speaker groups that are non-uniform. This means we have to reconcile some conflicting signals. We think about language families as tree-like structures where an ancestor language splits apart into daughter languages and these splits can occur repeatedly over time leading to tree-like structures with, with, with branching. Um, but this has to occur somehow from the sorts of waves that we know exist within languages. An innovation occurs and it starts spreading through a population and it may not spread through an entire language. Um, so we can have overlapping waves of innovation spreading. Um, language boundaries then um, have to be thought of as reflecting sort of discontinuities in uh, the correlation between linguistic differences and spatial differences. If everything spread uniformly spatially, we would expect to find language boundaries not emerging except perhaps through, um, uh, through some sort of overlap in these um, spread patterns. So if you um, think about the wave model as it was developed by Schmidt, you might think that um, boundary formation is the result of some sort of um, barriers to dialect leveling, right? Where the mechanism for language splits 
is dialect leveling that wipes out the sort of geographically, spatially, and linguistically intermediary varieties between um, varieties that are spreading and leveling that dialect, um, dialect diversity. We might expect then, under, under that kind of a view of what the wave model looks like, that language boundaries occur where there are barriers to dialect leveling. You could also think about um, sort of how the wave model translates into tree-like models. Um, in a model where you think of transmission, vertical transmission from a parent to a child being the primary diachronic mechanism operating in language. And under this view of what the wave model looks like and what um, language diversification looks like, you might think that barriers that prevent interaction between people, um, and in particular, the spatial organization of kinship, things like um, marriage outside of local communities, postmarital re residence patterns, and kinship structures, um, might be um, the sorts of things that could encounter barriers where we could create discontinuities in this sort of uniform spatial distance um, between uh, different linguistic varieties. So if there were no barriers or no discontinuities in the landscape, we would expect that between any two um, speakers of a language, their, ling their linguistic differences could be predicted by space, but we know that's not the case. Language boundaries do emerge, and that has to do, there's, there has to be more than just simple spatial distance involved there. So starting from this idea that there must be more to um, what creates these sort of boundary-like or split-like phenomena out of wave-like variation, um, I looked at the Eastern Miwok language family. The Eastern Miwok language family is one of two primary branches of Miwok, which is a language family of California that spreads um, from the, the coast near the San Francisco Bay Area, all the way over to the um, Sierra Nevada foothills and even parts of the High Sierra. So if you're familiar with uh, Yosemite National Park, um, if you've heard of that park and maybe seen some pictures of its, um, its startling landscapes, its beautiful mountains, um, this, this area covers everything from coastal plains to, um, to really high mountains. Um, the geographic region that the Eastern Miwok branch covers is about 19,000 square kilometers. So that's similar in size to the area of Lake Ontario, which is one of the Great Lakes in North America. But um, to get a little closer to home in Australia, the best specific reference I can think of is it's a little bit bigger, I think, than the country of Fiji in, in terms of spatial territory. I couldn't think of an Australian reference for 19,000 square kilometers, but hopefully that gives you an idea. The reason that Sierra, uh, that Sierra Miwok, Eastern Miwok, um, in particular is interesting to me is because there's obvious variation in the physical geography. Um, so there are some impressive physical structures that have served as barriers to European settler colonist travelers in the Eastern range where we find high mountains. Um, but there are other parts of this territory that are less impacted by those sorts of physical barriers. Um, the Eastern Miwok language family is right now severely endangered. Um, the Saklan language, which is the most divergent um, uh, member of this family, is no longer spoken. Um, so we have very little documentation of it. The Plains um, Miwok language is one that uh, uh, was impacted pretty early and dramatically by colonial, colonial impacts. So there's relatively little documentation of Plains Miwok as well. Within Sierra Miwok, though, there's relatively good documentation of Northern, Central, and Southern Sierra Miwok, which are the three languages that have been proposed to make up the Sierra branch of the Eastern Miwok um, played. Um, Miwok uh, society was non-agricultural. There wasn't a lot of political hierarchy, so um, people lived in towns, but they didn't have um, any sort of political organization or hierarchy among towns. There wasn't any um, territorial organization outside of these, these sort of local settlements. Um, there were clan exogamy patterns, so people um, belong to one of two clans and tended to marry the opposite clan, but those patterns were not very strictly enforced and they weren't very um, uniformly followed. So there's not an exogamy pattern that drives a lot of the, um, a lot of the family structures within this group. Um, and there was little, little transportation technology prior to the arrival of European settler colonists. So um, a lot of the uh, transportation here was done by people on foot 
um, for all of the reasons that people like to travel and, and see one another. Um, that helps us in understanding how people were moving about this landscape. Um, so people were moving around on foot and that's gonna be important to how I characterize space here. The boundaries between these, these Eastern Miwok languages have been drawn by a number of scholars who've worked in the area over the years. Um, in general, there is a rough agreement regarding where the boundaries between languages fall here. Um, it's a little bit hard, to, it's a little bit difficult to see um, with all of these overlapping boundaries. But what you can note here is that there are um, kind of general, there's a general consensus. I'm going to just pull up the annotation here so you can kind of see what I'm pointing to. There's a general consensus that there's a boundary between Plains, um, Plains Miwok, Northern Sierra Miwok, Central Sierra Miwok, and Southern. And those boundaries tend to line up across the characterizations that multiple researchers have proposed, um, which might suggest that there's not much to see here in terms of diversity or in terms of understanding the diversity. But you'll also notice that there's a lot that doesn't, doesn't line up here. So Miriam in particular has proposed that there's a lot more diversity in Plains Miwok and in the kind of lower elevation um, river valley varieties of uh, Northern and Central Sierra Miwok. And finally, um, it's not indicated on this map, but Catherine Callahan um, and Freeland and Broadbent in their 1987 and 1960 publications respectively, have suggested that there might be dialects within Northern and Central Sierra Miwok. There aren't a lot of geographic details to those proposals, but it's sort of a tantalizing prospect that what's been documented um, has suggested to the researchers who've done documentation that there's more variation and more boundaries to be drawn than what occurs in these um, early 20th century maps. And finally, this work was inspired by my contact with contemporary Miwok communities. Um, in language revitalization work, questions arose regarding the linguistic heritage of individual um, community members and also what sort of resources they should prioritize in revitalizing work in terms of which towns or which language and how do these languages relate to one another especially in northern and central, excuse me, northern and central Sierra Miwok. So the sort of region in the middle of the map, um, there's a lot of questions about uh, who spoke what language historically. So that's, that's where this all started. Um, and so in studying the Eastern Miwok languages, I used a lot of resources from the Bancroft Library at the University of California and also the Survey of California and Other Indian Languages. So these are field notes that were collected by researchers mostly in the early 20th century. So mostly um, around 1900 to 1920. Um, so the, there's a lot of different information out there. Some used 100 word diagnostic lists that were sort of collected by researchers who were sent out to find a lot of comparative information relatively quickly. There's a California topical word list that was created for, um, again, collecting sort of comparative information about California languages that tends to have uh, more lexical items related to the local environment. Um, Barrett, one of the researchers who worked on this, created a, an 850 word list that he used to collect his comparative information. And then there are miscellaneous elicited items throughout the field notes that have been collected over the years. Um, so this, this work looks at the historical dialect um, variation in, in Miwok by using information that's been um, sort of squirreled away in field notebooks and not thought about in too much detail. Um, so this, this page on the left is a page from Tazer's um, Northern Sierra Miwok field notes from 1900. And that's pretty typical of the sorts of information that I was looking at. So we're looking mostly at lexical data that was collected from 40 speakers um, is what's available. Um, these 40 speakers lived at 25 different locations that are identifiable in that um, area in which these Eastern Miwok languages were spoken. And the bulk of that information comes from 1900 to 1922. The speaker is mostly born between 1850 and 1870, but there is a, a small amount of more contemporary research. There was one um, field trip in 1982, for example, um, that worked with, at the time, older speakers, but slightly younger speakers than the rest of the data represents. So taking this, these word lists, um, you know, the first task that I undertook was to try to see whether we can create um, 
isoglosses representing the, um, the forms that were used by speakers in different locations. Um, so sort of mapping cognate forms and seeing whether people are using cognate forms for particular meanings. Um, and when, when I undertook this task, um, the, the story sort of represents what we know about um, the language boundaries that have been drawn by other researchers. Um, so again, I'm gonna pull up the annotation here. Um, so there's some light black lines on this slide that sort of show where those prior um, researcher designations of, of language boundaries were. And we find some nice isoglosses lining up with that. So there are 36 um, different um, meanings for which there are different cognate forms used on either side of this boundary that separates Iona and Buena Vista from the rest of Eastern Miwok territory. Um, where we find a boundary between Northern and Central Sierra Miwok on um, the classical maps, we find 12 isoglosses and they sort of divide um, in terms of whether West Point is part of the Northern or Central Sierra Miwok territory, West Point being up here. Um, and then we find a relatively strong um, isogloss bundle as well, where we expect the boundary between Central and Southern Sierra Miwok. So there are 13 isoglosses um, that line up in a bundle that roughly corresponds to where others have drawn that boundary. But there's other things that stand out here. Um, so again, we find West Point um, being somewhat close to Northern Sierra Miwok and somewhat close to Central Sierra Miwok. We find isoglosses that kind of run perpendicular to the language boundaries that have been drawn by prior scholars. And then we find some other isoglosses running through Southern Sierra Miwok, suggesting that there's more diversity in Southern Sierra Miwok than uh, is captured by those prior language maps. So that's sort of a, a basic introduction to the, to the, um, to the lexical variation here. Um, I also looked at the phonological um, patterns in different varieties. So here, um, I focused on the sound changes that have occurred in the Eastern Miwok branch as predicted by Catherine Callahan, Callahan's reconstruction of Proto-Miwok. So in um, Proto-Eastern Miwok, where there was an engma, we predict um, that there should be an engma in most varieties except for Plains Miwok, that northernmost variety, in which we expect an N. And this turns out to be, again, mostly borne out by what is found in the data. So here um, in Ione and Buena Vista, which are places that are traditionally associated with the Plains Miwok language, um, we do find that that engma has changed to an N. In Lockford and Comanche, um, which are sort of on the boundary between Plains and Northern Sierra Miwok traditional territories, um, we find some variation where egg, the word egg, um, which we'd expect to have an engma in Northern Sierra Miwok or an N in Plains Miwok has an N, but the word ni has the engma. Um, and uh, in the rest of the um, Eastern Miwok languages, the rest of Sierra Miwok essentially, we find that that um, engma is retained. So this again, mostly reflects what we would expect to find here. Uh, if we look at reflexes of the Proto-Eastern Proto Miwok, um, Esh, uh, which here I'm representing in the Americanist orthography in keeping with how um, Eastern Miwok has been transcribed over the years. Um, what we expect to find is that this Esh has changed to an S in Central Sierra Miwok and Northern Sierra Miwok, that it's changed to an H in Southern Sierra Miwok, and that um, in Plains Miwok, that northernmost variety, we expect it to um, change to an H when it's morpheme final, but an S elsewhere. So there's a, a more complicated condition change that has happened in um, Plains Miwok according to the reconstructions that have been done. But we actually find some variation. So we find, again, mostly what we would expect in, um, in Plains Miwok, this northernmost group that occurs on the northeastern side of that isogloss. We find an S in most places in Northern and Central Sierra Miwok, and we find an H in Southern Sierra Miwok. So again, um, creating some of the major language boundaries that we expect, but then there's some unusual variation. We find that some places the S is retained in Northern and Central Sierra Miwok. So this change doesn't seem to have occurred uniformly throughout all of the places where we would expect. 
Um, now, to some extent, this could reflect different researchers hearing things differently because it's a small number of locations in which we're finding things that contradict our expectations. Um, but this does bring up the question about what is actually happening in, happening in northern and central Sierra Miwok and how um, strong or, or how well borne out are our predictions about what should vary between these varieties. And then finally, um, we would expect that the proto-eastern Miwok um, vowel, the high central vowel, would be retained in all of these varieties. And yet we're finding a lot of evidence for that high central vowel shifting to a U to greater or lesser extents. It doesn't seem to be well organized geographically. We find that um, people are using U reflexes of that proto high central vowel um, it, to various you know, higher or lower extents in places that are kind of scattered around this region. Um, and it, it doesn't seem to correlate with what items, what lexical items are being used. So it doesn't seem to be a case of um, different lexical items occurring at, in different frequencies and this sort, of, um, this sort of moving its way through the lexicon. Neither does it appear to correlate with researchers. So it's not the case that all of the, um, uh, all of the places in which we're finding a lot of, of U reflexes are ones that were, um, that were recorded by the same researchers. So we're not finding any, any clear patterns there. Um, it's, it's possible that there's some researcher bias here, um, just in terms of people's ability to discern. So there might be some researchers who are more or less um, careful about their transcriptions, but there's nothing that, we can, that I can identify um, as a clear pattern here. So here we're finding an even less clear picture about what sort of variation exists in Eastern Miwok and whether it fits those early map representations of these really strong, clear boundaries between the three languages. So um, to sort of explore further what's happening here, I decided to aggregate, aggregate across some of these differences. So the question I wanted to ask next was, do aggregate measures of linguistic diversity across these doculects allow us to make better sense of the overall patterns of diversity within Eastern Miwok? Um, so I took two really basic measures, and I understand that these are, um, these, these measures lose a lot of information by aggregating we are, you know, we're trying to erase some differences and find the generalizations, right? We're not looking at every specific difference. Um, and these are, these are not perfect measures, but they are useful in this case for kind of um, getting a broad stroke measure of how different individual doculex are across this um, region of Eastern Miwok. So I took two measures here. Um, the first was simply a lexical distance, um, I've called it which is a measure of the percent of the vocabulary in a vocabulary list that was non-cognate across any two doculects. So for any two you know, documented um, varieties, um, how many non-cognate items were on the word list? And the range is 0 to 0 0.7. So some speakers, some speakers were essentially identical in what, um, what forms they were using. They might not have pronounced them the same way, but they were using the same words. And some people only had 30% of their vocabulary in common across this range. Um, in, in terms of the phonology, I used Levenstein, which is um, Levenstein distance, which is an edit distance measure. So here, um, uh, this is a measure that's used commonly in dialectometry to characterize differences between dialects. And um, basically how it works is you, when you take two forms here, Kenata, which is the word for acorn mush in West Point, and Knutis, which is the word for acorn mush in Big Valley, um, we calculate how many things have changed. And here, um, inserting or deleting a sound is weighted as half as costly as replacement with a different segment. This is one of many models that's been developed within the field of dialectometry. And because it doesn't assert a lot of complex phonological um, uh, theory, I use this sort of really basic measure that only separates out insertions and deletions from replacements and everything else is treated as sort of being similar. So it doesn't break um, things out into phonological features, for example. Um, so here we can say that um, we're going to score this as uh, two for inserting or for changing because this is a change to a different segment. We're changing the a to an e and then changing the final vowel in this form will also count as two. And then we'll add one for that insertion of an S at the end of this form 
And then we normalize this by string lengths. So we basically count the number of um, segments in the, in the form in one variety and count the number of segments in the form in the other variety. Here, I think we have seven and six, so that's 13. So we divide five by 13 and we get this value of 0.38 as the difference between these two forms. So you can do this across every single word in the word list that's shared between any two doculeks. And you can arrive at a sort of really general measure of how different the pronunciations are when people are using cognate forms. So there's two measures here. Are people using cognate forms? And when they do use cognate forms, how different are those forms? So our linguistic distances are created through these um, really basic measures of um, lexical and phonological differentiation. But then we can think about modeling distance. And to simplify this, I'm just going to compare two models. I did a lot more work to try to understand how to characterize distance here, but I'd like us to consider two things. The first is Euclidean distance, which is simply how the crow flies between any two places. You can draw a straight line between any two locations. Um, and here, these are sort of the lines that represent the straight line distances between all locations in this um, data set. Or you could represent the same territory as it is on the right here um, by calculating where people would actually travel. And here, knowing what sort of travel technology was available to these communities is important for being able to develop any sort of measure of cost distance. Now, there are a number of ways you can specify this model, um, and uh, more or less complex models could be used to characterize this, but I'm gonna talk about one model here, where the cost distance is calculated entirely based on elevation. Elevation, why elevation? Because elevation is something that varies dramatically across this particular um, area that these languages are spoken in, and it can have some pretty intense impacts on how people might travel. So if you look at the picture on the bottom left here, you can see this is part of where um, Southern Sierra Miwok was spoken. If you wanna travel between any two places um, that are represented on this particular image, say if you wanted to get from here to, I don't know if you can see my little annotations, but if you wanted to get from one green dot to the other green dot, you'd have to make some decision. You're probably not gonna travel as the crow flies, um, which would involve you know, a straight line path from one place to the other. And people have worked on trying to figure out how quickly people walk um, in different terrain, in varied terrain, and using elevation and slope to determine how quickly a person might travel. Um, so if you start with a sort of assumption of a baseline travel speed, you can weight that based on, the, um, based on the slope that somebody has to traverse over a particular distance to understand how much longer it would take. And that will determine not only how far apart places really are when you factor in those obstacles, but also whether somebody would choose to go over that obstacle or whether they'd choose to go around it. If things are too difficult to traverse or they take too long to get over, people will find ways around. People are very good at that. Um, and similarly, if things can't be traversed, for example, um, half dome here is probably something that's too steep for most people to get up and over. So people will have to go around most of the time. Um, very few people can get up and over that without any, without any technology. So back to the big question, um, we want to know what predicts variation in Eastern Miwok? Can understanding this space help us understand where, those, um, where that dialect variation between these really closely related languages has turned into language boundaries? Um, are there discontinuities in the, um, the, the linguistic similarities that are predictable based on plain old distance as the crow flies? Does isolation by topography, not just by distance, help us to understand where we're finding things that look discontinuous based on sheer space? Or is there something else here that's captured by the language boundaries that Kroeber has asserted exist in this language family, but not by space? So to do this, we can measure those distances, just like we measured the differences between the linguistic forms, and use mental tests to see with how well each of these particular characterizations of distance predict the differentiation that we're finding in the doculex. Uh, we can also subset the doculex that we have to investigate um, specific boundaries. 
So if I want to know um, what's happening in northern and central Sierra Miwok and whether that's the same as what's happening in this language family as a whole, I can subset just northern and central and see if I'm finding the same correlations within that subset as I find in the larger group. So what we find is that for um, most of these um, differences, space matters, but not as much as you might think. So to unpack this a little bit, um, one of the predictors that was used to predict these linguistic differences is just simply language area. Are any two doculects in the same or different language categorization based on those older characterizations of whether the location falls in a particular language territory? So if the place is, um, a, is, um, is said in prior research to have been within the Northern Sierra Miwok um, language territory, and I'm comparing it to a place that was in the southern Sierra Miwok territory, those would count as being within different places. Um, so are they in the same language area? That turns out to be the best predictor for most of these, um, to, for most of these groups. So within, you, uh, within all of eastern Miwok, um, that predicts a significant amount of the variation. Um, in Sierra Miwok, um, it's still a very strong predictor. Um, and what I want to point out here is that what we're finding is that space doesn't improve upon that in most cases, except um, when we look at Northern and Central Sierra Miwok. So if we just subset our data and look at only those locations that are um, when we're, where we're comparing a Northern Sierra Miwok group with another Northern Sierra Miwok group or a Central Sierra Miwok group, um, we find that this elevation weighted model that cost distance model that actually looks at how far things are when you have to go over or around obstacles um, is, is the best predictor of the variation that we're finding between the lexical forms used in um, the doculex of Northern and Central Sierra Miwok. When we look at those phonological distances, the Levenstein distances um, that kind of express how similar or different are the pronunciations of forms across um, any pair of doculex. Again, we find that these language area effects are not improved upon by looking at Euclidean or elevation cost distance. Um, and the elevation cost distance here really doesn't bias any explanatory value at all in terms of how people are pronouncing things. Um, but we do find that Euclidean distance, again, comes into play when we look at the differences between Northern and Central Sierra Miwok varieties, and also northern and southern Sierra Miwok varieties. So um, the boundaries that we're finding, or the differences that we're finding within northern, within northern and central Sierra Miwok and northern and southern Sierra Miwok, to some extent, are better predicted by distance than by whether or not things span um, a particular boundary. Ah, okay, these arrows express what my green arrows did a second ago. Um, so just to sort of sum up, um, you know, what this shows is that space does matter to dialect diversity here, but this more elaborate model of isolation provides only a marginally better characterization of isolation and only at a very small scale. In fact, the further work that I did on this, um, on this language family suggested that maybe there's not a language boundary between Northern and Central Sierra Miwok at all. Um, and that what we're finding is that the kind of small scale dialect diversity that's happening is, is predicted by, um, by these models of isolation, but they're not helping us understand where boundaries emerge. That's kind of interesting because people have long assumed that, that physical barriers are important to understanding those discontinuities. So this Bloomfieldian idea of density of communication um, seems to depend on something else. Um, once you get to a scale that's larger than the, the, you know, the shallowest dialect diversity, it seems to depend on something that might have to do with social identity and group formation or cultural interaction and exchange, things that fall outside of the, the physical landscape. I'm going to um, wrap up here with the Sierra Miwok study and move on and talk a little bit about um, looking at a top down, a um, macro diversity um, uh, approach and think about how we can think about things from a continent scale. So this um, work is um, 
It's work that was done in collaboration with a large team and some of the faces on the right here might be familiar to you guys at ANU um, because there's some folks that I think you guys know well. Um, so this is a large team um, that was an interdisciplinary in nature. We have people from linguistics and also from ecology and biology who work together to create um, a new approach to understanding drivers of geographical patterns in, in language diversity, looking at North America as sort of the test case to look at. So when we think about linguistic diversity, we can think about it in many dimensions. And I'm just gonna quickly summarize here. Um, we can think about just sheer language diversity in terms of the number of languages per area. This is a really basic way to characterize it. We could think about phylogenetic diversity. We could think about typological diversity, um, you know, the structural similarities or differences between languages. Again, I'm gonna keep it really simple and talking about space and diversity and just focus on language diversity, which is what we tackled with this paper. Um, we'll get back to why we might want to consider other measures of diversity a little bit later. Um, so the question is, what drives these spatial patterns of diversity? Some places in the world have many, many languages in the same amount of area of physical territory as you would find very few languages in, in another part of the world. There have been a lot of reasons proposed for this. So um, it's been proposed that ecological risk matters because communities have to form larger social networks in order to have enough support when times are bad, which would lead to lower language diversity. Um, but this sort of link between ecological risk, maybe growing season like Nettle has proposed, um, it's been disputed by others, right? So some people find good support for this and some people find that this is not the best predictor. Um, we could think about climate and resources as a driver. So this could be things like the climate people live in, the sort of habitats that are available and the the, resource of the resources, the biological resources that are available for subsistence within any particular climate. Um, these sorts of explanations have been linked to latitudinal gradients in linguistic diversity, how you find more languages um, per area closer to the equator than far from the equator. Um, so these have been supported by a lot of research, but other, um, other researchers have questioned um, whether these are enough to predict the sorts of patterns that we find in language diversity. Um, and finally, I wanna talk about physical isolation. So I've just told you that I don't think that physical isolation plays a huge role beyond really shallow, um, really shallow uh, levels of diversity. Um, that's not to say that, that some barriers are, um, are not perhaps more um, insurmountable than others, um, but as far as we can tell, it's not the case that if you put a mountain between two groups, they're gonna stop talking to each other. If people want to interact um, and marry each other or do something else of huge import to their lives, they'll find a way around an obstacle. Um, but on the other hand, others have found that this is a good predictor of, of patterns of linguistic diversity. Um, so we are left with no consensus about what factors impact language diversity at these really broad continent type scales. There's a lot of contradictions left. And so um, the group that I was working with developed some new ways to approach some of these contradictions. So in thinking about the assumptions that underlie some of the work that's been done in this area, we identified some assumptions that might be problematic. The first is that ecological drivers of language diversity are direct. Now that's not to say that there aren't direct impacts of ecological factors on languages, but that they're not all direct, that sometimes these um, impacts are indirect. Um, we also might want to question whether ecological drivers of language diversity are universal. Um, and in some cases, people have sort of proposed that the things that impact language diversity at one scale will impact it at another scale. I think barriers are a really good example of this, where people have just sort of assumed that if a barrier exists, it exists for anything that might impact people's communication with one another. So there's a lot to think about here. Um, and we wanted to think about this in terms of how drivers of diversity may interact with one another. There's some complexity there that needs to be disentangled. And whether drivers of linguistic diversity are universal or whether they vary across space. Um, so if we think about um, the kind of background pictures in this slide here, um, there's, there's sort of an example here of tundra vegetation on the right behind the text that's in Colorado, here in the mountains. 
Um, and we find that vegetation, which is a you know, certain sort of plant diversity um, here, and it's impacted by temperature, right? In the mountains, it tends to be cold more of the year. So things are under snow for longer periods of time. So temperature matters to this plant diversity. Um, but elevation also matters. We're finding this at higher elevations and that has, that has to do partially with just elevation itself and how that impacts plants and their growth. So we can think about this, but elevation also impacts temperature. So there are both direct and indirect links from elevation on the plant diversity in Colorado in these tundra environments, right? Eleva places at high elevation tend to be cold and they also tend to have limited resources in other ways that impact this plant diversity. Um, latitude also plays a role as well, right? We get a certain amount of sun, that's gonna affect the temperature, but it's also gonna affect the sun that's available for photosynthesis. So we can see when we look at this from a sort of biogeographical lens that the drivers of diversity in biology are, um, are interacting in complex ways. They're also spatially variable. So the picture on the left here is also a tundra sort of um, environment, but this is in Finland on an island where there's not a lot of elevation distinction. Everything is very, very close to sea level. So in effect, we don't have to worry about the impact of elevation here. Um, so different drivers are mattering to different extents in creating the same kinds of diversity patterns in two different places in this sort of really basic plant example. This seems to be something that we should consider in language diversity as well. So our group um, developed some new ways of handling these problems. The first was the interactions between different effects. And to handle this, we developed a path analysis approach. So here, if we have Y as our, um, uh, as our response variable, here this would be our language diversity, um, we can investigate the impact of any particular variable on that language diversity. And we could look at any other variables and their individual impacts on that language diversity response. But we could also look at sort of how these things are mediating one another. Does any particular variable have both direct and indirect impacts on our response, our language diversity? So this path modeling can also be handled in a way that, that accounts for non-stationarity of effects. That is differences in the strength of different effects across different geographic locations. And our group did this through using geographically weighted regression. So um, we could think about any two um, spatially organized variables and how they interact with one another. So here, if Y again is our language diversity, then X could be some environmental variable that we think predicts language diversity. And we could compare these two graphs and we could create um, a measure of how well these, um, these two things correspond to one another. But we could also um, target a cell and look at its neighbor cells as well and compare um, these cells with some sort of inverse weighting where we say that our focal cell, the cell that we're picking out here in our, in our answer, A, um, is the most important thing to, the, to how I wanna measure this for this particular cell, but I'm also gonna look at the cells around it um, and, say, and see what sort of patterns I find there too. And I'm gonna weight that in terms of how close I am to my cell of interest. So we can um, kind of compare one neighborhood in our response variable to the same neighborhood in our predictor variable with a little weighting, and we can do some regression and find an answer for just that cell. Um, so we're kind of doing a cell by cell um, analysis here. And what we get at the end of this, um, when we do this for another cell and another cell and another cell, is a whole map of answers where every individual place in the map has its own answer based on what's happening locally in its neighborhood. Um, so we combine these two approaches um, using a path model and using a geographically weighted re regression. Um, and Elizabeth, uh, uh, Elisa Barreto um, was really instrumental in making that method come um, to fruition. And what we found um, was that we could test how well some of these predictors that have been proposed in these controversial um, uh, works on drivers of linguistic diversity, how well those account for the linguistic diversity that we actually find in North America. So here we use the um, Smithsonian Handbook of North American uh, Indians map, as well as some information from the um, California Language Archive map to kind of supplement where that um, Smithsonian map wasn't very good. And so here we're looking at just 350 languages of North America. Since then, we've um, done our own mapping to try to fill in some of the gaps here. 
Um, but we can use this to sort of see how well we can predict language diversity. So to test these hypotheses, hypotheses, we've got our response variable, which is that observed language diversity. And we can think about um, isolation as being represented by topographic complexity, as I did in Miwok, but also by river density, which is um, a proposal by Axelson and Menrubia from a few years ago. We can look at resource partitioning by looking at ecoregion richness. So how rich are the resources um, that are available to people in these places? We can use um, precipitation constancy and temperature constancy um, to measure climate and the, the risks associated with climate, which gives us better granularity than something like growing season, we think. And we further um, included a measure of climate change velocity to look at how quickly those, all of these kinds of conditions have changed since the last glacial maximum in North America. So how much are changing conditions part of this? And we have some mediating effects here. So we know that population density matters to language diversity. We've included that in our model through a measure that we developed in another paper um, that kind of did some retrodiction of population density um, to estimate what was the likely carrying capacity of these places. Um, we also have an expansion and splitting mechanism. So we have a mechanistic model that we run in other work um, that I'm not gonna talk about in great detail today, um, but it basically predicts where language splits are going to happen um, based on that carrying capacity. So each of these things can have individual direct impacts on language diversity, um, but they can also all be mediated by population density and that splitting mechanism that we think is responsible for languages breaking apart. So that's what our path model looks like. Uh, ah, and so when we um, rerun this, um, we can uh, find, we can account for about 50% of the variation between um, different parts of North America and the language diversity that we observe there. But when we allow this to vary spatially, right, that's what these plus and minuses are doing here. They're showing us how much variation there is in any particular, um, any particular relationship in this path model, when we allow things to vary spatially and we um, use that um, geographically weighted model, suddenly that bumps up to um, being able to predict, to predict about 61% of the diversity on average across North America. So we're able to improve our predictions by allowing things to vary in space. So what does that look like? Well, the R squared values that we get for each cell show us a pattern where we're predicting things really well in the Pacific, uh, on the Pacific coast and the Pacific, um, Northern Pacific interior. And we're not predicting things very well at all in the South Central part of North America. Um, and that probably has something to do with how much we know about where languages were. In fact, the area that's green here is the area that has the poorest documentation of where languages were at or immediately before the time of European contact. There's just a lot of missing information there. But when we look at um, what explanatory variables are important in different places, we get some interesting results. Um, and we can zero in on the places that are best predicted by our model, where we have um, R squared values in the like 0.7 to 0.8 range. And here we're finding that things like temperature constancy, precipitation constancy, and population, predicted population density have the greatest impacts on any particular cells um, uh, uh, language diversity. Importantly, we don't find that river density is important anywhere, which is um, interesting because uh, a different study by Hua, Hua et al. in 2019 also found that landscape roughness and river density weren't very good um, predictors, and in fact, they might be spur spurious um, correlations due to autocorrelation in other works. Um, we also um, don't find that ecoregion richness, right, that sort of resource density idea is very important here in any particular cell. Um, again, that Hua et al. study um, found that a lot of the um, bird and mammal diversity patterns that they that looked initially like they were predicting language diversity weren't very good predictors once desert regions were excluded. So there seems to be, we seem to be finding similar things as other large scale projects are in terms of what sort of things are important for predicting diversity. Um, but we're finding importantly that what predicts language diversity in North America varies substantially from one part of the continent to another. Um, so this kind of suggests that 
if this is what we're finding at a continent scale, the global ecology of language diversity must be at least this complex. And that, um, you know, if we can understand that this is the sort of complexity that we're seeing in just sort of a really basic measure of linguistic diversity, it could help us to understand the complexities involved with grammatical diversity and phylogenetic diversity, those other characterizations of linguistic diversity that I mentioned earlier. So just to wrap up, I know I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, the, the, there's a lot to be answered here. There are massive gaps in our understanding of diversification processes and diversity patterns and how those operate spatially. And I think the way to um, approach this moving forward is to kind of build up from the dialect scale and also to build down from the continent scale. Um, so there are projects that I'm working on currently that try to do these two things. Um, I've moved on from working on the Eastern Miwok case study to looking at the Mono language, which is a Namek language, part of the Uto Aztecan language family. It's spoken um, immediately south of the uh, Northern Sierra, uh, Central, excuse me, the, the Eastern Miwok languages that I spoke about a moment earlier. Um, so here we've got good field notes that not just, that contain not just wordless, but also biographical and geographic information about the speakers that, that were involved. So there's some kind of small interviews there. There's some perceptual meta commentary, um, things like how similar or different different dialects sound to speakers of this language. And there's ethnographic information about contact across locations. Who was moving where, when, and for what purposes. Um, we also have ethnographic information about seasonal migration patterns. So there are communities that relocated to different locations seasonally, and sometimes that brought them into closer contact with other groups. We also have information about material and non-material culture across different groups. Um, so here, the, the idea is to look at not just a really basic measure of um, physical distance and physical isolation, but also to look at correlations between cultural and linguistic diversity to create some social network models that are geolocated so we can track not only where people were in space, but actually how connected they were. And also hopefully eventually to create some agent-based models to dial in some of the parameters that might be involved in fitting um, some of these models that predict how different factors impact language diversity. Building down from the continent scale, um, we are moving ahead with a mechanistic modeling project where we're simulating North American language diversity um, based on how we think language splits and language contact might work in a very, very rough way. Um, I think it's important also to think about using correlational modeling to look at language family and phylogenetic diversity in the same way that we've looked at language diversity. Are the same things, are the same environmental predictors that, are, that seem to be driving the diversity of individual languages also the same things that predict um, how many language families you'll find in an area, for example, or how distinct um, the, the groups that you find are. Um, and then uh, kind of keep, keeping with the building down from large scales to small scales, I hope uh, to explore patterns of structural diversity in North America using some of these same tools, and in California in particular, to incorporate some finer grained linguistic features into that analysis to really be able to understand what's happening um, within language families and across language families in a region that, we, that I know well. Good. Um, so there's a lot to be done here, and I'm really curious to talk with you all about it. Um, and I will leave it there for questions. Thanks so much, Hannah. That was a really thought-provoking talk.